away for another Vaughan boundary. <laughs> well, he's a great fieldsman, Philip Tuffner. He often falls over and he's brought it into his batting as well. Hello everyone and welcome to the Vaughan and Tuffers Cricket Club podcast brought to you by The Telegraph. Michael Vaughan, Phil Tufnell and me Ben Wright with you once again. Today we'll be looking forward to the fifth and final test between India and England with the visitors looking to end a thrilling series on a high. We'll be discussing if it's time for this current England setup to start dropping players, something Mike has written about for the paper this week. And if so, who is in contention to come in? Might one of the players facing the axe be Johnny Bairstow? He is preparing to win his 100th test cap this week. How many more will follow? And after having a Dancing on Ice star on the podcast last week, we've gone one better this week. Strictly Come Dancing winner Mark Rampkash will join us to discuss the series in India and what's to follow for England this summer. Right. Morning, Mike. Morning, Phil. Uh, have you enjoyed having a week off from watching England playing cricket? Well, I've had a couple of nice lie-ins. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't you have, you have set the alarm for 4am? No, but uh, but looking forward to uh, the last one. I think there's still a lot on it. I think there's still a lot to play for. I think we've mentioned it. 3, 2, 4, 1 and all this kind of stuff. So, uh, yeah, looking forward to the fifth. And final one in India. They've been great test matches. They have been very entertaining. Mike, you said last week that from your point of view, the preparation this week would be no different than if the series was 2-2. Do you think that will be the case with this England side? Would the uh, preparation have been any different uh, having lost the series? No, no, absolutely not. I, I think that they got away and, and probably played a bit of golf. That's uh, the norm with this England setup. Uh, just relax. Uh, I, I've been studying on Instagram the, the kind of uh, videos from up in the, the hills of the Himalayas up in uh, Dara Masala. They've been running the hills and just uh, getting up to yeah. the waterfalls there, which is great to see. It looks a bit choppy, looks a bit uh, chilly. A few bobble hats are uh, out and about with the England team. But uh, oh, I, I just look at this game. I mean, it's uh, the series is gone, but 3-2 sounds so much better than 4-1. I think if they, yeah. if they lose uh, heavily here and it's 4-1, uh, we, we've got to be honest, it, it's been a really bad winter for the England team. You know, they've won absolutely nothing. You know, the World Cup, very poor. West Indies, white ball series, lost both. They then go to India, the, the 1-0 up and they end up losing 4-1. I, I just think it's a different conversation. And then pressure really starts to build on that T20 World Cup in June. And England will have to uh, find some kind of... Uh, rhythm of play uh, and get close to winning that that event, which they should because they've got all the tools to do so. But uh, I, I just think this week, as much as it's, you know, the dead rubber, it's never a dead rubber. Uh, there's a huge amount for a lot of these players to play for, particularly the batters. Yeah, uh, I think it's a, a good week for the England batting unit because there will be pressure because Harry Brook comes back in in the summer. There's no question about that. So someone misses out in that first Test match starting in July. Um Will it be Johnny Bairstow? Will it be Ben Folks? Will it be somebody else? We'll have to wait and see. But uh, uh, a few of those players need a few runs. So I think it's quite a good week for the selectors in a way to, to they won't be saying to the players, by the way, one of you is missing out, but you just know subconsciously as a, as a, as a player that Harry Brook will be coming back in at number five and one of the England players this week won't be playing in July. Uh, Mike, it, it, interesting you say that about pressure. Uh, do, do you think there is a lot of pressure now being sort of heaped on this England side to perform, to start winning? Oh, look, uh, look you've got to win. You've got to start winning games of cricket. That, that's that's your roles. And um, I think what this England management do really well is take away the pressure. But fundamentally, you know, Phil, you, you can have a, a, a coach in Baz McCullum and a captain in Ben Stokes say to you in, in front of the group, just go out and play. We're not putting under, you under any pressure. You go back into your room and you look at your numbers and you go, oh, I need a score. <laughs> I need a score because, as I said, Harry Brook is coming back into this England side. This England management for two years now, um, you could argue that they dropped Alex Lees for Ben Duckett, but that was almost like they, they wanted Ben Duckett in the side and Alex Lees just wasn't playing the style that they wanted at that time. So... You could argue that really that wasn't a drop in. There hasn't really been an England batter that's been dropped. Officially, you're, you've been dropped from the team. Now, someone will be getting dropped for Harry Brook. Harry Brook's definitely going to come back into this team. And I just think it's a good week for the England management and the team because 
they will know that subconsciously. You know, Ollie Pope's had an incredible innings in that first test. Since then, nothing. You know, Ben Duckett has had that incredible innings. But apart from that, not a great deal. And I'm not saying those two are under pressure. I mean, Zach Crawley's had some great starts, but he's not, not got the 100. You know, all these players have been thinking, Four, all right, we've got the backing of the coach and the captain, but um, if Johnny Bairstow gets 150, which, by the way, don't rule him out doing that in his 100th test, and, and they stick with Ben Folks, and Johnny says, I'm carrying on in test cricket. I'm not even indicating that he might be quitting test match cricket, but he gets to his 100. You never know. Mentally, he might go, that's me done. Um, but if he gets 100, he's going to play. So where's Harry Brook going to fit in? He's definitely going to come into this England side. So someone will be missing out in July. On that, do you think Harry Brook uh, has got the talent to be a three or do you think that is a waste of uh, his ability? Well, he tried it. They tried him in the ashes and he, he looked all at sea at three. He's a five. You know, he's a five, six, uh, maybe four in time. But no, I think Harry Brook, we, we saw that. Last year, with the ball moving around, his, his technical side is probably not quite there against the quality seamers that they come up against these days to, to face that new ball. Uh, and you'd want him at five all day long. He's got such a game to take the opposition down. And he plays spin brilliantly. Um, so he's the number five for me. So it's, I'll just keep saying it, it, someone's missing out. And it's just a, it's just a race this week, it's quite a crowded who... middle order then, isn't it? <laughs> it's a race to see who that player is who will miss out in July. Uh, you mentioned the bobble hats that the players have been uh, wearing as they're going for the runs uh, up in the mountains. Um, do you think the weather is going to ha have an effect uh, on this match? It's sort of very different style of cricket to uh, some of the games we've seen so far in the series. I think it's been sleeting up there, hasn't it? You know what I mean? I think mm -hmm. the guy said it was they, they turned up. There's been a lot of rain. Um, I think this test match, um, they say, is going to be affected by the rain. So it's going to be a shortened game. I think that the only thing England have got to think about is do they play two and two? I think the wicket will turn, you know, at, just because of subcontinent sort of conditions and what have you. But um, they might be thinking to themselves, do they give Gus Atkinson a little run out? I don't know. Mark Wood, does he come back in? Do we give Jimmy a little rest? Or are they going, you know, with their best side to get themselves back to 3-2, as we've been talking about? So I think they're the things. Um, I think you still play your two spinners, don't you? I think they've deserved it. So um, they're going to go along there, have a look at the pitch. If it's green and, you know, looks like it's going to zip about a little bit, like it sort of shows. I don't think there's been too many test matches up there to get too much of a steer on it, has there? But uh, Boomer comes back, doesn't he? You know, he, I think everyone's going to be shaking in their boots uh, in the England batting lineup. But uh, yeah, it's going to be. Who do you think they're going to pick, Mike? Are they going to stay with the two spinners? You reckon? Well, fundamentally, I think it'll be a, bit, a really good pitch. I think the, the batters should be able to, you know, get get decent scores. I can't imagine it's going to be a dust bowl and, and spitting from. From ball one, there might be a bit of swing around. I think it's about twelve to fourteen degrees. Uh, I, I want to see Gus Atkinson. I mean, yeah. I want to see him, but I'm also a bit wary of seeing him because I just think it's so unfair on these players. You look at Ollie Robinson last week. You know, he plays, gets criticised. He looks short of a gallop, understandable. But he just haven't played any cricket. You know, he haven't played any cricket for five or six. Same with Gus, Gus Atkinson. You throw him into a a test match. Say, go on, Gus, go and bowl quickly, and he might do for a spell or two. But when you get into the third and fourth spell. You know, understandably, you can see a bit of a drop off in the intensity because they've not been playing any cricket. I just think England missed a bit of a trick actually on this trip by not playing a couple of the bowlers in the eight or uh, games just to give them some overs in the legs. Um, I, I want to see him, but I'm also a bit wary of seeing him because I just think it's very unfair on a young player. I mean, you go back to when we played Phil, we probably played too many warm up games and did too much away from the test matches, but at least you got a bit of cricket that when you went into a test match, mm. you were kind of cricket fit. And, you know, as a bowler, it's not just the bowl, and it's standing out in the field. How do you replicate standing yeah. out in the field for six hours? And you have to bowl for what? Maybe an hour of those six uh, in your, your first day back. Um, so, look, I, I'd, I'd go Atkinson and Wood this week. Uh, I, I want to see England with a bit of pace. I think for England to be a, a team going forward, that they've got to try and find a, a few new combinations, um, you know, because pace. As much as it's not everything, it really does unsettle many batting units. And, uh, 
you know, there's no Stuart Broad now. Obviously, Jimmy's coming towards the back end of his career. Uh, how long will he play? England somehow have got to start finding some combinations from what we've been used to over the last 15 years, which has been pretty much always Anderson, Broad, Anderson and Broad or Broad. You know, I, I think England have got to start looking at a, a, a couple of different combinations. Yeah. I think the days also, I mean, I've been thinking about this, you know, I think the days of the Jimmy Andersons and the Stuart Broads are gone now, really, for seam and pace bowlers now. You know, I don't think you're going to be seeing these guys first on the team sheet, you know what I mean? When there's a big game, Anderson, Broad, they were always there. I think now it is going to be like a horses for courses, you know. I think the batting unit's going to be pretty stable, as it's shown. But I think the bowlers, and especially the fast bowlers, I, I just, I think they're just going to rotate now. You know, I don't think there's going to be a run. You know, I don't think there's going to be a seven hundred test wickets for a seam bowler ever again. Because I just don't think they'll be fit enough to do it. Yeah, there'll be, there'll definitely never be another Jimmy, will there? A word about Johnny Bairstow. No. Obviously, his hundredth, hundredth uh, test, his hundredth cap. Um, I was reading that uh, of the 14 players, I think who've got to 100 caps, his is the lowest average. He's got the the fewest hundreds. But there have been some unbelievable highlights in that career as well. Obviously, he's been keeping as well, which, um, um, I mean, Alex Stewart got 100 caps and he was keeping for, for a lot of those matches as well. But um, it's been a sort of inconsistent career, hasn't it, Mike? Yeah, but you know, I, I wouldn't look at his average. I think the impact that he has when he plays is uh, immense. Um, and when you add into that, he's had to keep wicket. Uh, when you add into that, he's moved up and down the order. You know, He's never had a set uh, position in the order, so that cannot be easy or well, anyone that gets to 100 caps is a, a legend you know to to play 100 times in test match cricket is incredible uh, and to think that he's done it um you know playing the way that he plays uh, you know having a, a, a kind of change in the order on a regular basis being in and out of the side I mean I didn't even realize he was getting close to 100 when someone said a few weeks ago oh Johnny's four oh well has he, has he got to 100 test matches because I think he's had a career where there's only been a, a couple of times, and you mentioned 2022 when he got uh, 600s. There's only been a couple of times when he's really dominated in Test Match cricket, and, and they've been quite short periods. So to think now that he's fought through some uh, adversity, showed a huge amount of resilience, um, I, I don't think there's many better players to watch when Johnny's going and he's firing and those eyes are popping out. I, I think he's a, an incredible player, and... I hope he gets some runs and I hope he carries on playing Test Match cricket because I do think there's uh, there's plenty left in his tank. Um, if, he, if he has an iffy week and obviously Harry's coming back, he, he might be under a huge amount of pressure for his place in the side. And uh, I don't want to see that. And I, I always look at Bairstow when he's under a bit of, of gas and there's a bit of pressure and a bit of spotlight on him. More, more than ever this week when you're in your 100th Test Match, um, it wouldn't surprise me at all if Johnny went and struck 100. Yeah, no, I'm absolutely delighted for him, actually. As you say, 100 test matches, what an achievement. Um, it really, really is. I think sometimes he's been a victim of his own success in a funny sort of way. You do get these players who, you know, you know, give him the gloves, stick him at three, give him this role, give him that role, when some guys just sort of plod along in their own, role, you know, sort of, set way of playing and sometimes they sort of reap the benefits of that he's always the one that sort of seems to be adaptable and being able to change and you can get labeled that but but you're right Mike I think I think that some of the best test match innings I've seen have been from Johnny Bairstow you know I have been commentating out of my seat you know watching some of these not I mean, and the ball just disappearing. I mean, we go back to New Zealand at Trent Bridge and a couple of three others, you know, but uh, have been jaw-droppingly just special, special innings, is, you know. And I think that when you look back on your career, you know, there are different sorts of hundreds, perhaps, you know what I mean? And you're talking about impact, and I think that that is what he has given, given this England side. Hmm. Uh, and also, Phil, uh, give me a Johnny Bairstow style mentality. You know, if, if I'm yeah. picking a team, I, I want I want a Johnny in my team. You know, I want someone that's yeah. got a little bit of fight, a little bit of spirit. At times, a warrior. <laughs> at yeah. times, he's, a, he's an angry man. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I want that. You know, he, he gets those eyes going. He gets that body language. He gets his chest out when he storms out to bat. Oh, go on, Johnny. 
you know, I, I want that style of cricketer uh, and personality in my side. So uh, I hope this week goes fantastically well for him. So it's a real joy to welcome to the podcast the former Middlesex Surrey and England batter Mark Rampakash. Mark, thank you for joining us. I was reading your last column for The Guardian in that you wrote that England need to realise that fun cricket isn't always smart cricket. So is it fair to say that you've been frustrated by their performance in this series? Uh, no, no, I don't. I don't. I wouldn't say frustrated. I, I think, um, you know, a lot of ex-players um, will will look at the the sort of new style of Ben Stokes and and Brendan McCullum and admire it and and think that um, you know when when you're in an England shirt and you, it's the pinnacle of your career and to go out there and play with freedom is not easy. It's um, you know that there, there is always um, you know huge uh, emphasis, huge status in playing for your country. Um, so what they, what I think Ben Stokes and Brendan McCullen have done brilliantly, along with everybody else watching, is that they've managed to get players in there to, to play as though it's almost like they're playing on a Saturday afternoon for their club. You know that they they play aggressively. They look to take the the batters look to take the aggressive option. That that is all wonderful. Um, I mean, one thing that I've I've uh, been interested in is to to say uh, that uh, for England as captain Ben Stokes wants a specific style of play because whenever I played for England you were always told to go out and play your own game and play to your own strengths and then often in a batting lineup you know you'll have different types of players and that can be a strength um so uh, to to be prescriptive and say that you only want, you want everyone to go out and play the the same way which is very aggressive is unusual I've not seen it happen before um, but they've backed it up probably with selections. Um, but you know, with with you know, with one day cricket, when you're playing against a white ball that doesn't really move on on flat wickets, well, yeah, you can kind of do that. But within Test cricket, of yeah. course, we know that there are so many different conditions. So that's really interested me. I think the key thing for me has been that if England are going to be ruthless winners, if they're going to be consistent winners, then yes, they they need to have that style of play and confidence in their strengths. But equally, there are passages of play within Test cricket where you have to be smart. And uh, I think we saw them come unstuck at Lords when Ben Dockett got out hooking and, uh, you know, Nathan Lyde had gone off injured. And that passage of play stood out really where we weren't very smart, I don't think. Um, and I was critical, particularly of Joe Root, actually, who was number one in the world, let's not forget, before Brendan mm. McCullen took over. Uh, and I was so happy to see him get back to being Joe Root. Uh, and play a, a fantastic innings. 48 singles, I think he scored. He got 100 off 215 balls. It was a fantastic innings. England needed their best player to get three figures, and he delivered, and he delivers time and time again. But it was by being Joe Root and not something that he isn't. So I thought that was smart cricket. I thought it was entertaining cricket. And um, so that's yeah. kind of really what the debate's been about. Yeah. I mean, throughout the, the baseball era, I've been really interested in uh, your perspective of, of, of the man management of the team, because you were, you know, famously one of the most talented uh, batters of your generation, but had quite a stop start um, international career, constantly dropped and recalled. Do you think you would have benefited from the kind of selection consistency that McCullum and Stokes have displayed? Or do you think you would have bristled with the lack of seriousness? Um, well, I, look, I've got no doubt that within the dressing room that they're serious. And, you know, Ben Stokes yeah. is, a, is a very competitive cricketer. So, you know, um, what we what we hear publicly about the style of play, I'm sure there's a lot more going on within the dressing room. Um, in terms of continuity of selection, I think all players, you know, myself, Graham Hick, anybody, really, there are so many I could name in the 90s. It, you know, it was yeah. a bit of a revolving door. You know, you said goodbye at the end of the test. You weren't so sure if you were going to see them <laughs> the following week. Um, uh, I, I look back at those times and think, well, look, you had to take your opportunity. And I didn't. I didn't take my opportunities to cement myself, to establish myself. And so, you know, it, it, it was it was a stop start career. Um, but there's no doubt that England are better for the fact that they, they have uh, picked players and backed them a bit more publicly uh, within the dressing room, uh, given them a run of games. Um, there's no doubt that players will, will respond to that, in my opinion, 
Um, that's not to say that it can become too comfortable and complacent. Uh, and I, I wonder at times, you know, the, the statement McCullum came out with about Zach Crawley, I, I thought was, you know, there's been some interesting comments there, you know, about not being consistent and Zach's, Zach Crawley saying, well, he doesn't really have to work on his defence. You know, that those to me are strange statements, um, you know, yeah. for, an, for an England opening batsman. But I think... Uh, if you take someone like Johnny Bairstow, for example, um, 600s he made in 2022, uh, they have loved him, shown that he's valued as a character, and they've absolutely got the best out of him. Someone like Ben Duckett at the top of the order, um, who doesn't leave too many balls, but plays to his strengths has been a real success. I mean, to see those two openers blossom has been so important for the England side to get them off to a bit of a start. So, you know, I think all players would feel valued uh, and backed uh, by this um, uh, partnership of, of Stokes and McCullum. Ramps, you're still involved, obviously, in uh, you know coaching first-class cricket in the counties and what have you. Uh, talking about the sort of McCullum and Stokes attitude and brand, as we like to call it, what are you saying to the sort of like the guys now who are coming into first class cricket and looking to establish themselves and then go up the ladder to England. Are you, are you sort of saying to them, you've got to play this way or, you know, how are you sort of trying to coach them? My understanding is that a lot of counties um, are having some really good discussions with their players um, uh, and I think Middlesex are no different. Um, young players are clearly looking at what's going on at the England environment and think, well, that's the way they play. That, that To get into the England side, to be selected, I've got to play in that fashion. So if you take someone like Hasib Hamid, who is perhaps a, a traditional top order player, has he got to go out and change his game? Um, possibly. Uh, he's got to be, um, you know, anyone like Hasib or, or say a Sam Robson or... You know, those traditional types of top order batsmen in English county cricket. Um, yes, they've got to make sure that their attacking shots are really good. So if if a bowler misses short and wide, they've got to hit it. If, if they miss slightly short, maybe they've got to take on the pull. They've got to execute their attacking shots when they get the opportunity. But equally, as you know, uh, county cricket, the pitches sometimes can be tricky. Um, maybe not coming onto the bat, et cetera, et cetera. And you've got to... You've got to fight. You've got to have a balance between. I think the players have got to have a balance between having an eye on international recognition, um, uh, but also playing what's in front of them. Um, now that that's tricky because the the director of cricket has picked players this winter, almost disregarding county cricket, uh, and so um, if you're saying to a young player, well, look, you know, it's important that you play and score runs. Uh, and that that is a good habit to get into, um, they can come back and say, well, hey, no, if I play an aggressive style, I might get picked um, by by England uh, on my sort of potential. Um, and if I'm very aggressive in franchise cricket, uh, I can still get in the test side. So it's it's it, it, this whole thing that's going on with England has led to, I think, some really thought-provoking discussions within county cricket and how we develop players. And I still think you'll probably speak to 10 different coaches and you might get 10 different answers. Mm. Yeah, Rams, can I, so, so in the county game, all the players now, I mean, because Ben sent the message uh, and Baz, that this is the style of cricket that we're going to play. Now, do you think English cricket is going to commit to this for many years? Or is it going to be like in football management that in two years' time, Ben and Baz kind of aren't in that position, a new captain and coach coming in. We're going to go back to the style of cricket. But let's be honest, English cricket for, for the last 20 years have had a lot of success in Test Match cricket, playing a certain way, being smart at times. Do you think this style of cricket is 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 here to stay for the long haul or is, is it just this management? I, I think it's here to stay. And the reason why I say that is because of the proliferation of short format tournaments and the fact that professional players probably practice at least six months of the year trying to smack it out the ground. So, uh, you know, I, I've, I mean, I, Michael, I've, you know, without wishing to, uh, you know, put you on the spot, I've seen, Vaughn, I've seen you play some fantastic shots, very, you know, short ball, hook it for six, you know, hitting it on the up, you know, you were a, a player that, 
played the ball on its merit, but you you imposed yourself when you had the opportunity and played shots off the front foot, back foot, all around the wicket. Um, you didn't need a second invitation to to pounce on a bad ball. Now, that's what I think the modern day players are trying to do. Um, but they're playing to their strengths because whereas, um, you know, back in the 90s when I was playing, uh, test cricket was the, the most important game. And the domestic game and your formative years as a young player were were um, geared towards first class cricket and and knowing where your off stump was. And then you kind of evolved into one-day cricket. The, now, the young players are coming at it from a different angle. You know, from very, very early, young ages, they are playing the reverse sweeps and they're trying to tap into power shots. So they're, they're almost running before they walk. Um, and, and so what I think has been quite clever about the current situation uh, with England is that they're trying to pick players and play to their strengths, their natural strengths, because this is what they've... This generation of have come up with T20, they've practiced it, they love it, and that's the way they kind of want to play. It's their natural rhythm. Whereas, you know, back 25 years ago, it was about perhaps building an innings, seeing off the new ball, and then you earn the right to dominate. Then that, th This group of cricketers don't really think like that. So I think it's quite smart management to try and um, get them to play in this aggressive fashion, play to their strengths, but equally, uh, and this is, comes back to the point I was trying to make about England, if they're going to be, because uh, I think right now they're ranked at eighth, despite all this uh, publicity about their approach, they're still they're still ranked eighth. And to climb the test rankings, they need to become you know clinical, uh, not just entertainers. And that's where I think there's a conversation. Ben Stokes has said we want to be entertainers. Okay, but can you win games and and are there periods in matches where you need to do something it might be quite ugly, but you need to do it, take yourselves over the line. Um, that's the bit I think where England are going to evolve. And I'm sure that Ben Stokes is well aware of that because he's one of the most adaptable players in world cricket. He has shown that. So I'm sure he's aware of that. Um, but I, th I, I just think um, that it even after the management of Ben Stokes' captaincy, when he goes and Brendan McCullum goes, I think it's a natural evolution for coaches to tap into the natural style of the modern day player. Ram, you, you made a, a really good point there about the publicity of the side. I mean, I, I'll go back to the 90s, early 2000s. This is an England side. Let, let's be honest. Uh, their defence of the World Cup was a poor one in India. You know, they were the reigning champions, went to the World Cup and had a really poor... They had to beat Holland to reach the 2025 Champions Trophy. They lost the T20 series and the 50-over series in the West Indies. They're 3-1 down in a Test Series in India. The women's team have not had a great winter. The under-19s have had a poor time of it in the World Cup. Yet everyone's telling us how great English cricket is. I mean, back in the day, in the night, you were sent on rockets to the moon for, for, for winters like this. <laughs> Dressed as a bunny rabbit with ears. I, I had ears <laughs> out of a window of a rocket. But it, it is amazing, isn't it? This kind of PR around the team and the way that they've played and the excitement with particularly the Test Match team. So my question, is, is it, no, are we in an era where the supporters just want entertainment and actually the results are secondary? Because so far, this you know the Baz Ballers in the last three series, they haven't won the last three series. They've drawn in New Zealand, they've drawn the Ash, now they've lost to a, a quality uh, Indian outfit, which is always difficult to win in India. But you know, fundamentally, it, are we in an era where actually the supporters are almost like the players <laughs> that they just want to play this entertaining uh, style, and the fans just want that kind of style? Yeah. yeah look, it's a great question, Michael, and uh, you know you're dead right about the comparisons. I can think back to Charlie Colville you know, piling in in the early 90s, you know, and Bob Willis, you know, on the verdict and all that. And um, yes, if you didn't have a great day, you didn't want to turn on the TV or listen to the pundits. <laughs> um, that is for sure. I, yeah, several things come to mind. I mean, I almost feel, even talking on the podcast, I almost feel that any inferred criticism is almost unpatriotic in the current climate. Um, and, you know, the I think yeah. one of uh, Robert Key's greatest achievements really is... Uh, of course, we know he worked in the media prior to this, the director of cricket job, and he's managed to get the media on side incredibly well um, to mm -hmm. promote this um, acceptance, if you like, of the 
we want to entertain and we don't play for draws um and you know that sort of thing um you know i we, i was talking last night actually with tuffers about the the tour and the and, and it's almost like the cricket's got in the way of you know the the golfing trips and the five star hotels and <laughs> you know they, they talk about young spinners but you know what what's wrong with having a match or two between test matches you know if you if you want your young spinners and you want to dictate to county coaches that they should be picking young spinners well, what about England's responsibility to give them a couple of games in India, perhaps first class games against opposition, and then Reham Ahmed and, and Bashir will continue their development? Uh, you know, it's, I'm saying that half tongue in cheek, but it, you're, you know, it's, I think the, the PR of the England team at the moment, as I say, as someone who who tries to be, I think, balanced and and you know, praise when it's due, but equally constructive criticism when it's due. And that's why I picked on Joe Root, because I didn't think he was playing as Joe Root does uh, with his batting test match head on. I didn't think he was doing that. And I think he did it last test. And so absolutely praise him to the hilt. So, um, yeah, I suppose uh, I was at the Oval, uh, you know, during the, the, the summer and, you know, doing a QA and a with the punters. And I sort of said, look, you know, who's who's loving baseball? And the whole room loved it. The public are completely on <laughs> yeah. board with this, um, you know, go out and play a few shots and action cricket. And Ben's captaincy has been brilliant, proactive in terms of field placings and bowling changes. And he's trying to make something happen. I think the, the cricket followers love that. Um, but equally, at what point do you say as a team, well, yeah, actually we might have got that passage of play a little bit wrong. We'll reflect on that because the best performance performers in sport, as I see it, they have a cycle where they play review, think about what they did well, what they can improve on, go and practice and then play again. That's the cycle of, I think, professional sports people. And, you know, is that happening at this England level or are they just saying, well, we're entertainers first and foremost. Joe Root entertained me when he was number one in the world by scoring brilliant hundreds in Johannesburg, in Cardiff, all over the place with fantastic batting, uh, smart batting. Um, I hope he continues to do that. Did you think there was a bit of reflection between the third and the fourth test? Because in the fourth test, Joe was was batting a bit more like the old Joe. I mean, they did lose, but they were, they were uh, up against a hell of a bowling attack. There seemed to be a slight shift in how they were playing. So do you, do you think that they are taking that on? I, I think they may have done. Um, I mean, there's no there's no doubt that in India they've wanted a piece of baseball and they wanted to take it down. Um, and, you know, I think England at times haven't helped themselves. I think some of the press conference, some of the comments from Zach Crawley and then Ben Duckett where, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of, of Michael Atherton's article where, you know, Ben sort of spoke, spoke about the more the merrier, we'll chase anything down, we want to be history makers. Well, they were. They lost by 434 runs. You know, yeah. that, that that to me, that that sort of bolshiness. I mean, you know, you might get that in a pre, you know, in a pre boxing match, that sort of language. And but, you know, that, uh, people, anyone who's played the game for a long time, you know, cricket it's hard to do that. It's very hard to do that, especially away from home in India. So, you know, I think that doesn't endear themselves to to anyone in particular. And, and, and I think the Indians have really been up for trying to take down this England side in home conditions. Let's not let's not forget that Michael mentioned they're three one down. But the first Test match, uh, in, an incredible knock from Ollie Pope got them out of jail. But they were there was a deficit of one hundred and ninety on first innings. They probably should have lost that game. But you know, so uh, I think I, I hope. And as I said to you, Ben Stokes is a very adaptable cricketer. In the World Cup two thousand nineteen, yeah. he got the man of the match uh, for his batting for a reason. It was a fantastic innings on quite a slow wicket and England were in trouble and he took it deep. He took it deep. It was a brilliant innings. Of course, he's done it in Test cricket at Headingley. Um, so he's shown himself to be adaptable. I'm sure he's aware that the group need to grow in terms of the nuance of Test cricket. Um, but I think, I suppose, initially, that they just want people to go out and enjoy the stage, really. Be a bit more extrovert shake off any inhibitions, go and play your game. And they, they're certainly making progress, aren't they, with the England part, opening partnership in particular. You know, Harry, Brick, yeah. Harry Brook has been, is a wonderful talent. So they're making strides forward. But I hope that Ben, Sto uh, ben Folks, for example, 
Ben Folks has has got to be authentic. He's got to go and deliver what he does with the bat in his way. And you can't expect him to go out and bat like Bearstow. That's not the best of Ben Folks. So I think there's room within this um, style of play that each individual has to play to their strengths. Ben, I, I think the proof was in the pudding about that conversation between the third and the fourth test. It's, 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 it's always, you look at the way that players play the week after a, a, a poor performance or a mistake or two. Joe Root went back to being Joe Root from three years ago. Joe Root's 100 in, in the last test match was a pure innings. I didn't see too many reverse sweeps. I didn't see him ramp the seamers once. I didn't see him dancing down to the spinners trying to launch it over mid-wicket once. Yeah. Maybe Bumrah not being there helped his mentality, but the proof is in the pudding that the, the team can send out as many messages as they want. And Joe Root can, you know, he, he can defend that shot that he tried to play in the third test match. It was the wrong time to play that shot. I don't mind you playing that shot when you're well on top in the test and you're trying to kind of nail home your advantage, but it was the wrong time to play that shot. So then the week after get a magnificent hundred and then always defend the week before shot. You know, the proof was there for me that uh, Joe Root went back to being Joe Root. Um, they'll never, ever admit that one or two outside of the, the England bubble had got it right. But many, many ex-players, Ramps is absolutely right. We've all been around the game for many, many years. And, you know, we, we can kind of see when certain things are brilliant within the England team. And there's many things within this England team that is fantastic. What they deliver in terms of entertainment, uh, the culture around the team looks great. It looks a fun environment to be in. I'm not saying that there's never, ever been a fun environment with the England team. I'm sure there's been times where English cricket hasn't had that environment. But I think in recent times, the environment has always been very good around the England team. Yeah. But this team seems to have this little bubble of fun. They'll always protect each other. Um, but I do think they've got to be very, very careful with some of their messaging because I think we've said on this podcast a few times, you don't want to come across as being smug as yeah. a team. You want to be humble. You want to deliver. And if you're trying to play the, this expansive, entertaining game, which is great to watch, understand that when it goes wrong... You will get criticised, but don't always protect your method. Sometimes come out and say, yeah, we might have just got that wrong today, but, you know, we'll have a go next, the next test match or tomorrow we'll have another crack at it. But today we did, yeah, we made a couple of, you're allowed to admit that you've made a couple of mistakes. I've not heard any time in this basketball era the England side come out and say, yeah, we might have got that wrong today. Yeah. And it sort of hands a bit of uh, motivation to the opposition as well, which is perhaps not the smartest thing to do. <laughs> Given that we think that they're possibly evolving a bit, do you think that there'll be changes to the team for the summer, Mark? Well, um, I think, uh, you know, Harry Brook is such a wonderful talent that, you know, it's highly likely he'll come back into the side, I would have thought. Um, so you start to look at those batting positions. Um, you know, Ollie Pope's a funny one, isn't he? You know, wonderful innings in the first match and then a pair uh, in the last, I think. And, uh, you know, he's been a bit um, sort of up and down uh, I, I still feel he looks a little bit frenetic at the start of his innings, um, you know, and whether number three is the right spot for him. You know, I, 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 I'm I, still not quite sure, but um, I guess the, the, the person that we, we're probably, the you know, the focus will be on is is Johnny Bairstow um, and what he, yeah. you know, what he does this match. Um, uh, you know, I thought he... He looked pretty good, actually, in the last game. And I think he only got, I say he got 40 on the 30. But I thought the way he played, um, I thought he looked he looked in good touch. And, you know, did, you know his normal determined self. But he delivered some good shots. Um, and uh, and so, look, I, I he's 34 years old, Johnny Bairstow. Um, I think uh, after this last test match, I think he's, he's got to have a good think himself as to what he's got left in the tank, energy-wise, desire-wise, hunger-wise, to play test cricket. It's, it really examines you mentally, physically. Has he got enough in the tank to say, yes, I still want to hit the number of balls. I want to do the training required to be successful in test cricket. Um, and I think he's got to really ask himself those questions at 34 years old because he's coming under some pressure with competition for places with those young batters and I look at him and think he's the one really where Johnny himself and then the management have got to work out what they want to do with him. Um, you know, and, and it may be that, you know, of course he'll have the option to go off and play loads of franchise cricket and still be very successful. Um, if he wants test cricket and does the required work, I still think he can be a force and be a very good senior player for England. But 
you you know sometimes you you can come off it just one percent and you don't quite reach the standards that you set for yourself and so i think the individual over between now and and the start of when he's going to start playing in the english season uh, you know he's got some serious thinking to do either or ramps uh, entertaining cricket or winning cricket winning yeah win- winning for me yeah yeah when you made your test debut against the west indies in 1991 who was harder to face a young curtly ambrose or an aging malcolm marshall oh it's a good one <laughs> It's a, it's a good, that's a goodie. That's a goodie. That's a goodie. Um, I think um, probably, probably, uh, uh, probably Ambrose. I'm going to go Ambrose. I always found that the tall bowlers very awkward. Uh, you know, if, I, if there was one bowler I could take out of my career and, and perhaps kick in the shin, it would be Courtney Walsh. So, um, <laughs> but, <laughs> You'd have to reach your shin first. <laughs> okay. Three way choice. Lords, the Oval, or Headingley, where you scored your first and your hundredth first class hundred. Yeah, fond fond memories actually. I, I and in and in order, I'd probably go the Oval, Headingley, and then Lords actually. Uh, in terms of fond memories, Ooh. yeah. Yeah. Ooh. Okay. Well, Ooh. Um, Ooh. Yes, Lords. Uh, I presume Head- Headingley for the food as well, Ramsha. Headingly for the um, is that, is that fish and chi- is that fish and chip shop still there, Brian's, just outside the ground? Yeah, because, Brian's. Yeah, I got absolutely ugly mugs just on the entrance there. Ugly mugs, the cafe, mate. I, I got initiated in Brian's back in 1987. Gat took us over there, the whole team in our Middlesex blazers, and uh, Gat had a couple of jumbo haddocks, and um, yeah, we enjoyed <laughs> our, our fish and chips and baked beans. <laughs> I've never seen so much fish. In Mark, aren't you currently the president of Middlesex? Yeah, yeah, yeah somehow, and I and I note the surprise in your in your. Uh, qu- well, I just I just I just think I just think your ordering of the the pitches might not go too well, get down too well at Middlesex. <laughs> well, it's always been a fractious relationship between Middlesex and the MCC. Um, you know, we're well, trying to build yeah. bridges, but um, no, I am president currently, half halfway through my term. And, um, yeah, very honoured as an ex-player to be asked to be president. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I can schmooze with the best of them. Right, we've got, <laughs> right, Ramps, we've got two more, and these are the trickiest of the lot. And I know this from personal experience. Well, I don't actually know the first bit of this one from personal experience. Averaging over 100 in two successive seasons, 2006 and 2007, or winning strictly? Oof. Oh, Oof. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, how can that even be? No, <laughs> the, the the cricket one, the cricket one, one hundred percent. And here we go, last one, mate. Um, Argentine tango or salsa? I mean, there were certain, you know, enjoyable moments in both both routines um uh but i think i'd I'd probably go salsa uh uh, you know um the music the music was great wasn't it hot 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 love that bit of a cricket tune that used to hear that everywhere we used to go didn't we cat you know uh who let the dogs out in the caribbean you know that sort of thing used to love a few tunes (laughs) love a few tunes (laughs) testing my strictly knowledge here but didn't you get a perfect score Four tens from the judges for your salsa. Very, very fond memories of the salsa. Yeah, um, and uh, the the uh, when when uh, in fact actually what is my worst moment as well because um, when we first did it the microphone got caught. My microphone got caught on my partner's dress, and um, <laughs> she oh, yeah, pulled away. And the, micro- you restart, the microphone restart, didn't you? Caught- yeah, it was that was real. I mean, that's still I still can't watch that because it was absolutely horrendous live <laughs> TV. Oh my god! And you're told, you know, you must never stop. Um, yeah. But physically, the, my, the cord went onto her, so we couldn't really move. So it was an absolute disaster. But luckily, the Bruce Forsyth came on and saved the day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go 
one, Bruce. Good old Brucey. Well, Mark, thank you. That's fantastic. Uh, it's been uh, it's been brilliant having you on. Thanks for having me on, guys. Great to see you. Fellas, I've just got a little question. After listening to Rants there, do you think in sport all around the world now, and all sorts of different sports, do you think it doesn't necessarily matter if you win anymore? It's just about how you play the game, how you play the sport. Oh, I, I, I'll answer that, Phil. I, I think, um, oh, you can't tell me football is not about winning. Football and no. the football fans, I, 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 I'm not too sure that... Uh, I think I think there's an element, though, Phil, even in football, that fans now want their teams to play a very expansive, aggressive, uh, on-the-front-foot kind of game. You look at... I mean, the perfect example is something like West Ham. Now, West Ham and David Moyes has had incredible success, but he loses a couple of games and they're on him, aren't they? Because he plays quite a strategic, if you like, old school style of uh, football. But it's, uh, he's got them to, what, the seventh in the Premier League, won a European trophy last year. Um, but the West Ham way, they, they seem to want to play more expansively. I think I think there's that balance, isn't there now in cricket? That because we've seen a lot of expansive play from the England side, and it's brought some success. You know, it's brought uh, quite a few victories in in terms of individual tests, but it's not winning them the big trophies. And I guess the question is always going to be, um, what what do you prefer? Do you prefer being uh, entertained, but necessarily not always winning, uh, and not winning the trophies at the end of the series, but you still get a huge amount of entertainment? Or would you rather a team that can entertain at the right times but play smart at the right time to get on the front foot and kind of rub the opposition's noses in it um, to make sure that you do win that game? Um, it's all going to come to fruit in about 18 months' time in the Ashes overseas. It's all the build-up to the Ashes for me, the cricket team. Yeah. I mean, just the, the other sport that I watch very closely is rugby. And um, definitely that there's... There, there's been something infectious about baseball. The England rugby team, the England rugby setup has referenced baseball. They've talked about wanting to uh, entertain and they've talked about wanting to engage the fans. So the new captain, Jamie George, has talked about that as well. But they've lost a few games. They lost, uh, lost to Scotland up at Murrayfield the weekend before last. And definitely they're getting the criticism for not winning. And winning is definitely still important. Ben, ben, do you think, right, this is a question for both of you, Phil, as well. Do you think that it's like, so this 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 group of players and management has created basketball, it's created this expansive way, but they've not won anything big yet. Do you think it might be the next kind of team that, you know, because the England side will play it more and more and more, they actually might be the next management that get the kind yeah. of fruits of what's happened in this term? Because that can sometimes kind of, it can take a bit of time and a bit, yeah. of, bit of look here uh, uh, along the way. Um, do you think that's happening? Because it's amazing, really, when you think about this approach, that there's been a book written by our good friend Nick Holt. Yeah. yeah. The Baz Bolt Way, you know, which is, is staggering, really, about a, a style of play that hasn't won, you know, it won an Ashes series and another series and a, win, a series in India. You kind of go, yeah, that, that, that's, that's right to write a book. But, you know, I think the rest of the world kind of chuckle that way. <laughs> <laughs> we're lauding this method, yet it's, yet it's not winning anything big. True, but I think we're in, we're in danger of forgetting what came before, which was the one win in 17 tests, right? So it has been transformative, even if it hasn't you know, produced series victories. Can I just go back to that one win in 18 or whatever it was? If you actually look at that time when those, um, you know, the, those lack of victories came, you just look at what was happening within the England team. It was COVID. England team, the England team yeah. were travelling more than any other team in the world. Now, no other team was getting on the plane and sitting in hotels and not being able to communicate and not being able to mix and not being able to go out. So I think you've got to look at that as almost, you know, it's kind of understandable with what the yeah, England okay. team were doing at that time compared to other teams around the world. So I don't think the England team were that bad to have only won one in 18. I think it was COVID times. They were changing the squad all the time. Uh, it was an awful time. And you look at Joe Root, captaincy reign. He, he basically was captain when England were trying to win the World Cup in 19. So they gave him no kind of uh, loving the test team around that time. And then it was COVID. Yeah. It was a tough time to be the England captain. The, the reason I say that just quickly, it, it's just sort of like, you know, sometimes I look at the boxing, you know what I mean? And there's these sort of YouTube guys going at it now, aren't there? You know what I mean? For the entertainment value. You know, 
the 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 live golf live golf no you know they're now not playing to in the open and all this kind of stuff so it's almost sort of like it, it's not necessarily about the, for the cash we, yeah, yeah, a little bit perhaps you know <laughs> so is it going to be sort of like you know is it moving away from a sort of like the trophies on the mantelpiece a little bit and just saying that you were one of these fantastic players or whatever sport it was, you occasionally won, but you gave us so much entertainment that that's what they're after. Mm. But I, I do think we're, we're definitely in an era where the, 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 the New England cricket fan, it's a cult following, you know, and, and Rams yeah. is right on the, and, and just saying, that, you know, if we're on this pod and we criticise them in any way, shape or form, oh, you're just negative, you're negative. You know, you don't support the team. Get behind the team and go, well, well they're losing. What do you want us to say? How great they are when they're getting hammered. <laughs> yeah, I suppose I suppose another way of looking at it is um, I was looking at the viewing figures for the Ashes. Spectacular, sort of record-breaking viewing figures. Um, you know, would the powers be, the be, be happier with that than a series victory? Probably. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. As it might come down to bums on seats, you know, bums on seats, yeah. cash in the bank, sponsorships gained, and things like that. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting time for sport, I think, in the next sort of ten years. Just where it sort of goes, and whether these great sort of traditional series, and as you say, the Open and the Masters and things like this. I mean, you know, the the, the golf guys have given up playing for the Masters, you know, and given up playing for these fantastic trophies that when you're, when you're 65 and you got your slippers on, you look back on and say, that was worth every bit of cash or is the 400 million worth it? I don't know. The, the, the frustration, though, Ben, it, it is in sure the fact that this Baz ball has been greatly entertaining and it should have won. That's that's a frustration. Is that they should have won the Ashes and they should have won in New Zealand and they should actually be two two in this series. You know that that's the real frustration. Yeah. It's just uh, and I was uh, I put it in my column this week and I, we spoke about it last week and Ollie Robinson seemed to be the the brunt of the criticism in the last test. So a bowler took the criticism for the batter's failures last week. <laughs> <laughs> Always <laughs> that, that made me chuckle. Yeah. <laughs> Although, although to sort of end, 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 sorry, to end on an opti- sorry, to end on an optimistic note, I do wonder whether that sort of shift between the the third and the fourth test means that this side is evolving, and whether it won't take a change in management and a change in captaincy for us to to see the benefits of of basketball, Whether whether this management team can evolve and can take it up another notch and start winning stuff. Yeah, well, well, fundamentally, the week before they lost by four hundred and thirty four. You know, and then the following week, they did play a little bit uh, smarter at times. Joe Root's innings was was, was a, an example of that. Uh, and they only just lost that test match. They only, I think they only needed 60 or 70 more runs. Whereas the week before, yeah. they lost by 434. But let's also, you know, they batted first on a pitch that was deteriorating. So batting first was a huge plus in the fourth test, probably more so than the third test that India had the opportunity to bat first. Uh, so we've got to be, you know, wary. We've also got to be also understanding that winning in India is very, very, very difficult. Quick question for you, Phil. There have been some interesting comments uh, about the young England spinners, uh, Tom Hartley and Sherb Bashir. McCullum has obviously said he wants the spinners to be playing lots of county cricket this summer. Hartley says he wants to play alongside Nathan Lyon at Lancashire which, uh, you know, for much of the season, you're going to wonder whether they're going to be able to play two spinners at the same time. Hartley has said he, uh, and meanwhile, Somerset have said they are open to loaning out Bashir. Uh, What do you think is best for those two? I think that sounds about right. I think Bashir's got a bowl, simple as that. Um, You know, probably, are they going to play two spinners down at Somerset? They might do occasionally. Um, but you kind of think that Jack Leach is going to be the number one down there. He's just got a bowl. These two guys, uh, w- what they what they can't do is come back from this fantastic sort of platform and learning experience and then not put it into practice. They've got to learn how to bowl on slightly flatter pitches. They've got to learn all these different kind of things. They've, 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 they've They've got themselves in this great position now. They don't want to come back now and then just go back in a white ball cricket or play second eleven cricket. You've got to get 
bowling. So for Bashir, I think definitely he's got to go away and learn his craft. He's shown what he can do on spinning pitches, which is a great start. Now he's just got to sort of find that craft about different pitches, different situations. So that only comes with bowling, I'm afraid, for a spinner. I think with Tom Hartley, it is slightly different. I think, you know, what a, what a person to learn from Nathan Lyon. And it, and it's not necessarily just about bowling. You know, I think they will play together. I think they will play two spinners, or they definitely look to play two spinners Lancashire. Um, but I mean, it, it's just a slightly different change of mindset, I think. And, um, you know, I'd be following Nathan Lyon around and I'd be in his pocket all summer. You know what I mean? And he'll just <laughs> tell him things, you know, little tweaks and bits and pieces about bowling, but then also, as you say, the mindset about playing in conditions, different conditions and playing test match cricket. So if I was Tom Hartley, I would look be looking to hang around Nathan Lyon as much as I can. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll be honest, I, I feel sorry for the counties in this because, you know, let's be honest, once the season starts, the England players don't play a great deal for their clubs. And they don't necessarily get in the cars and drive rather fast to go and play a game. Then all of a sudden, England saying to them, oh, you've got to play these players, and if you can't play them, they've got to be sent elsewhere. Uh, so I do feel sorry for the county. Fundamentally, if you're a, a, a county director or a county coach, you've got to pick the team that you believe is the right team for your team to yeah. win that game of cricket. You know, yes, it's about preparing England players, but, you know, if Tom Hartley misses out for Lancashire and they only need one spinner, well, Nathan Lyon's going to be that one spinner. He's world-class. When they signed Nathan Lyon at Lancashire, you can't tell me that they thought that Tom Hartley was going to go to India and do what he's done. They probably didn't think that Tom Hartley was going to be anywhere near an England touring party. So Lancashire have to do what is right for them. Um, Bashir's an interesting one because you're not going to play two. I, can, I mean, if you're playing two spinners in April, Something's not quite right because you can't tell me that it's going to be a two-spinner kind of month. I mean, <laughs> why not play one? <laughs> well, again, this is the, the kind of scenario with English cricket that, you know, you, you know England have picked a, a team to go to India on the back of no county cricket. You know, let's be honest, Bashir and Tom Hartley haven't played a, a great deal of county cricket. Their numbers certainly didn't um, staggeringly say, I need to get on that plane to go to India. And <laughs> Nothing to say. We need to be playing county cricket, um, so I do find it quite uh, amusing. But the counties have got to do what they need to do. It's about winning games of cricket and picking the right teams. Um, you know, I do think it's a different era as well, though, Ben. That these players do play in maybe not Bashir, but he has been at Surrey, and uh, you know, he's been at a couple of counties, so he will know other players. Tom Hartley's a little bit in the franchise system. He's obviously playing for the originals, which will have. Uh, other county players uh, amongst it. So I think going to another county is not like in our era, you know, where you just had one club. It was like Yorkshire, Middlesex. Yeah. You wouldn't even thought about going and, and having a, a month playing for Leicester or Derby. You wouldn't dare. Whereas I do think this year it's a little bit easier for, for them to do that. Um, but the counties have to, and, and, and I, I personally agree that they, they have to just look after themselves. That's what they're there for. You know, these, these coaches and directors their jobs, in some cases, are on the line. So they've just got to pick their best team. And if Bashir's not in it, or Jack Leach isn't in it, or Tom Hartley's not in it, I'm afraid that, uh, that that's the, the nature of the beast. Yeah, I mean, w w one thing about having an overseas pro like a Nathan Lyon, though, Mike, I mean, you remember when the overseas professionals came over in our era, you know, I mean, y you learn so much from them. You know, I think it would be wrong, perhaps, for like a Tom Hartley, just as Nathan Lyon turns up, to then, you know, lose that 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 season of all that knowledge of sitting next to him. You know what I mean? That you really all that expertise, you know. So I think that he should stay and hang around with him and hopefully look to be put into the side and what have you. But even if he doesn't, as you say, sometimes you can't play two spins and everything. But just just bowling in the nets, just warming up with guys like this as a spin bowler, you are just like a sponge. So, um, yeah, I think he should definitely stay. And as you say, Bashir, I think he's got to get bowling. Got to get bowling. Right, that's a wrap for today. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Phil. And huge thanks to Mark Rampakash for joining us too. The three of us will be back next week for our final episode of the series, recapping England's tour of India and looking forward to what we can expect this summer. As ever, there's loads of coverage over on the Telegraph website. Make sure to check out the Cricket Nerd newsletter too, and that's available every Wednesday. Until next week, goodbye.